we recognize too the very uncertain economic future, the unemployment and massive challenges for many of us around the world. We at Field and Graduate University, our staff, alumni, students and faculty bring an array of experience and research to understand the coronavirus and its impacts on individuals, communities and societies of bringing what we hope will be light in the face of darkness. This is indeed an epical challenge for the whole world. Katrina Rogers, president of Field and Graduate University, would like to share a few words here as we begin. Katrina. Thank you, David. Welcome, everyone. For those of you who were on the call on Tuesday, welcome back. I know that this second call, uh, also on the same topic, will continue to deepen and evolve our understanding, awareness, and will provide opportunity for reflect, reflection. And for those of you for whom this is your first call, welcome. I think you will find this a tremendously valuable learning experience. And as I look at the chat, it's just delightful to see so many of our alumni, as well as our students and faculty, trustees, friends, community members, and members of the public. Most of you know who Fielding is, but for those of you who don't, we are a private nonprofit graduate school with students and faculty all over the United States and other parts of the world. And we perfected what is known and originally invented a distributed graduate education model for graduate education in the social sciences, primarily psychology, leadership, education, organization development. So welcome again. And I, as I reflect on this, as David so rightly called out, this common problem for all humanity, I hope that our time together here is both uh, inspires and challenges all of us, that it inspires us to understand our common humanity and the things that we can do together and the things that we need to do, not only to stand in solidarity, but also to act collectively. And I think it's that collective action that will, will pass the test of time as we look back on uh, this time, which will affect every single one of us in some way. And I also think it helps us live into that same challenge to cultivate the the characteristics of humility, of compassion, of empathy for ourselves as well as for others. I think those are the things that will sustain us through this period, which may be a long period and beyond. So with that, and not to take up any more time, I will turn this over to our wonderful colleagues and panelists. And thank you all again for being here right now with us. <clears throat> Thank you, Katrina, for those heartfelt words. In challenging times, my colleague Rich is often fond of quoting Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. Rich, before we start, perhaps you have a few thoughts to share with us? Uh, thank you, David. So Churchill, of course, is referring to World War II, a crisis of historically unparalleled severity. In this context, this terrible pandemic crisis also provides an opportunity to learn together to learn how communities can come together, our common humanity, as Katrina just put it, and provide mutual support, to learn about the importance of volunteerism, to learn how governments at all levels, local, state, national, global, can effectively work together, not only to deal with pandemics, which we now know will surely recur, but also the host of challenges we'll be facing as a result of global warming and climate change topics that Fielding is very strongly focused on. These are indeed challenging times for all of us, and for some of us, truly frightening. We have Fielding students who are on the front lines of healthcare, exposed daily to contagious COVID patients. We have students who have fallen ill, and we all know personally people who are frightened, including at times myself, people who are currently suffering, some seriously, and possibly we know people who have died of COVID. To help us better understand what is happening, we're about to hear from a tremendous panel that comes from such diverse yet interrelated fields as healthcare and medicine, approaches to physical and psychological therapy and trauma, the intersection of media, technology, and psychology, and leadership in international healthcare crisis activism. And as David noted, our panelists come from all over the US and as far away as Australia. 
Uh, I'll turn this back to David, but I want to just give a shout out to David who really put a huge amount of work into this and to Fielding's Director of Alumni Relations, Hilary Molina, uh, who works so closely with us to put this together. Back to you, David. Thank you, Rich. Each participant will share their thoughts for about seven to eight minutes. Our panelists will speak to these three themes, what the coronavirus has meant on the ground in their experience, the perceptions of the coronavirus, fears and realities also in their experience, and then the lessons learned and what is needed from their experience. Please use the chat function to let us know where you are and feel free to use it to connect with other attendees. No worries on your camera or microphone. The only people you will see or hear are the panelists. If you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function. We will begin with Dr. Christopher Womack, who PhD, MBA, MS, MA, the Director of Healthcare Policy and Advocacy at Johnson & Johnson, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. Dr. Womack has been working in the healthcare industry for the past 29 years and he has worked in various disease states such as oncology, HIV, immunology, mental health, diabetes, and others. He's an experienced lecturer on topics such as healthcare disparities, prostate cancer, mental health in the black community, and social determinants of health. Dr. Womack's most recent research is titled African American Men, a Critical Examination of Dynamics Involving Their Decision to Pursue or Not Pursue Screening for Prostate Cancer. He's also a contributing member of various groups focused on healthcare and involved in projects centered on addressing healthcare disparities. Chris. Dr. Willis, thank you very much. Dr. Applebaum, President Rogers, and our panelists. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, it is due to uh, dealing with such a uh, horrendous uh, event taking place, uh, not only in the United States, but also globally. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, just for the purposes, just a general disclaimer that uh, the views I present here are not those of my employer and they are views presented based on my own experience as a researcher and also knowledge from healthcare disparities and also experience in healthcare itself. Next slide, please. Ah, there we go. Uh, first of all, the approach I want to take as it related to this presentation was to focus on healthcare to give a view of uh, where we are now as it relates to COVID-19 and probably those steps that led up to some of the events that have been going on. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was the, as the title, what does this mean on the ground? What's going on on the ground? And an interesting thing is taking place, and this has been going on for a while, is the access to healthcare itself, how it's been compromised and impacted uh, for those needing it. Uh, an example of that has been the massive closures of institutions throughout the United States. Uh, in 2019, 47 hospital institutions have been closed. What does that mean? If you think about it now, the overwhelming population of individuals flowing into emergency rooms, loading of hospital wards, uh, and now to a point where you see tent cities popping up, not only in places like Central Park, but um, hospital parking lots where they're having uh, tents set up to service patients. Uh, the closures of many of these institutions have caused the overwhelming load of people we see uh, flowing into these institutions and not being able to be served. Just to give you an idea of the impact that's been going on, uh, let me give you some dates and figures as it relates to the closures of institutions. 28 hospitals closed in 2015, 21 closed in 2016, 16 closed in 2017, 23 closed in 2018, and as I mentioned, 47 closed in 2019. What does that mean? If you think about those who are uninsured and underinsured, what are they using as their primary care service? The emergency room. Those emergency rooms are overwhelmed and overpacked now. 
And now looking at where we're at now with COVID, we find that the uh, healthcare systems aren't able to service the needs of those who need care. And not only need care, but also be able to take care of those who normally might have symptoms, but would go to seek care, but to the point of saying it's too crowded, I'm not going. So what are they? They're carriers of COVID-19 and may be passing it on to others as well. So that's a huge issue that we're dealing with. Also, the other area is unbalanced scale, uh, where we've gone from the prevention and treatment methodology of focusing. Right now, we're focusing on prevention. What is prevention? Social distancing, mask, you hear thinking about gloves. We're not focusing too much on treatment because there is no treatment. Right now, all you're trying to do is maintain those who are on the cusp of, of dying or whatever to make sure that they have some sort of care and able to rec recover from their illness. You're also seeing the issues of have and have nots as it relates to resources. What does that mean? We've always known about have and have nots, but it has been exacerbated more uh, because of COVID-19. To give an example, there was an article, I think, in the Times where they talked about uh, individuals in a wealthy area of Miami where they were able to order kits to be tested. So those individuals had kits to be tested, but other individuals who may need it and may have uh, underlying conditions cannot get those uh, kits to be tested. This is important because this is an area of healthcare that's been compromised and, and also uh, injures our ability to be able to treat those and prevent the disease from spreading further. The other component is healthcare disparities in our neighborhoods. Uh, this is actually coming up very broad in a lot of discussions where uh, individuals have been shown to, uh, like I say, the CDC has present, presented information where they've shown in certain areas where there are white and black individuals living in the area, but a higher percentage of African Americans not only presented with the disease and had to be hospitalized, but also a higher degree of them have passed away because of the illness as well. Uh, next slide, please. One year I just wanted to focus on also was the fear and the realities. The interesting thing about the fear and the realities is what's stoking those fears. And, and one of the problems we seem to run into is one, there's no single source of truth. What does that mean? Uh, that means there is not one place you can go to where it might be a funneling information. Maybe it's the WHO, the CDC, where they take all their information and funnel it into one location where individuals can get actual information as it relates to uh, COVID-19, what to do, where to go, uh, what preventive measures to take. Uh, to be uh, I totally frank, you have to also have to understand what are their motives. Uh, to give you an idea as I talk about motives, uh, Think about those, and I divide them up into three different areas. One, economic, uh, the other one, uh, political, and another one, providing cures, or I, I call them uh, uh, fake cures that are provided. The economy itself, the NCAA is actually talking about trying to find a way to restore college football. Uh, even if it means not having fans in the, in the uh, stands or things of that nature. And the reason for that is purely economic based and not looking at the safety of the individuals participating and those who are sitting in the stands. The concerns with that is rapid transmission uh, of COVID-19 because remember, as we're looking at preventive measures, is not killing off the virus, is nearly trying to flatline it so that we're able to reach a level of finding a treatment so that we're able to prevent uh, others from be being infected, and especially those who have had compromised conditions as well. The other side of the issues that we worry about are political. Uh, political, as we see, uh, bipartisanship, who's on what side, Democratic, Republican, who's making decisions, um, thinking about opening the economy so that uh, we don't suffer anymore, but what about those individuals who might prove to be sick and spread the disease even more, or even create a greater spread of the disease by now saying, okay, government says we're safe, let's all come in together and start our regular shopping and things of that nature. So that's a huge issue right there. One of the realities also that we have to be aware of that's gonna take place of, uh, the existing model is gonna be restructured. 
And what does that mean? Healthcare is being changed. Uh, healthcare is being changed because of the fact, look at telemed. Telemed was a novelty. Now telemed is being used consistently across the board. And uh, matter of fact, Medicare are making changes in terms of how that's reimbursed. Also prevention and treatment are being looked at as well um, as it relates to uh, the models that are being changed and actually related to testing of COVID and how the new testing kits will be developed as well. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Lessons learned and, and what's needed. Uh, one of the lessons learned that we have to be very observant is we need one source of the truth. One source of the truth means where is that information that's vital to everyone to know in terms of what they need to do, where they need to go, and if they can't get to places of care, what can they do in the meantime until they're able to get to those places of care? And that's very important in terms of stemming the tide of, of this virus as well. And also one of the things we've learned is effective collaboration is needed. A disease, a virus does not have geographic boundaries nor a passport. It goes wherever and whenever it pleases and infects whomever it decides to infect. So as we look at global collaboration with organizations such as the WHO and other groups to share research to understand and track the virus and be able to say, where is it originating from? Why is it gaining strength? How can we stem the tide of it if we cannot stop it itself? So those are very important points to keep in mind. One, understanding the one source of truth and also effective collaboration. So with that, uh, Dr. Wells, I'll end the presentation and take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Womack, Chris. And uh, I guess I have a question right away. Uh, you're working in the industry. What's the prognosis? And particularly the prognosis about protective gear for folks, tests uh, to let us know whether we have it or you know, have had it, uh, and vaccines. Uh, what are your thoughts on the prognosis? Prognoses, I guess it would be. Well, the great thing about vaccines is that uh, all the pharmaceutical manufacturers are working together. Uh, that's very key and important because you have to understand the manufacturing process because someone can come up with a possible treatment cure, but do they have the ability to mass manufacture what needs to be provided? Uh, so they're all working together. No one is looking at this in terms of a economic windfall. They're working for society itself to make sure this doesn't spread any further and to say, how can we all come together to find a cure, get it out to who needs to be, uh, have this medicine and make sure it's adequate supply as well. And as it relates to uh, protective gear itself, everyone's working overtime. You see repurposing of factories, uh, in order to produce more masks, shields. There are other groups who are shifting their creation of or building certain medicines that they normally do for others that are more in need uh, to make sure they are available for the public for treatment. Uh, there's a question um, in the chat for you, Chris, uh, from Penelope Bustamante. How can we capitalize on the current discussions about the structural inequalities in the healthcare system so more people are actively engaged in understanding and transforming societal inequities. It would be great to come out of this with the beginning of a foundational shift. That's a very interesting question. Matter of fact, I did have a discussion with someone about this actually earlier today from one of the uh, advocacy groups. An interesting part of the discussion was that the stigma as it relates to mental health they feel will be lifted even more because there are more people dealing with mental health issues and they feel that the wave is going to be much greater once we come out of this. If you look at healthcare, before you think of mental health, you're thinking inner city, urban areas, things of that nature, or rural areas, but now you have professional people uh, with stress overload um, and, and things of that nature going on. The healthcare inequities have already existed. Uh, Part of me says this pulled the sheet off of it, but I think this really flipped the mattress over. Uh, and these are really gonna be acknowledged. And just to give one point, not to, to take too much time, is that uh, even with the concept of telemed, everyone thinks great, use a smartphone, use a tablet, have a conversation with a doctor, but everyone doesn't have 
access to the internet. Everyone doesn't have a smartphone. Even in communities where they say, oh, well, you're connecting to Wi-Fi. I say, go drive into Newark, New Jersey and try to connect in a Wi-Fi. Good luck with that one. Um, so that's not always available. So I think these will be recognized even more, especially with this type of element, because you have to stop all elements of the virus, not just one. A very specific question for you, uh, Chris, also from Julie Smensick O'Brien. Why is there such reluctance at the national level to use the Defense Production Act to produce a sufficient number and reliable chain of tests, uh, both diagnostic and seriological? That's a very good question. I keep going back to uh, politics. Uh, I, I think it's more politically driven than anything else. Um, that can be used. Uh, thank goodness that there are a number of uh, companies, meaning well, shifting their manufacturing capabilities. We have things that are uh, companies that do uh, distilleries are shifting to do sanitizer and things of that nature, uh, which is great. But I think this is more around a politics for anything from my general point of view. Thank you so much, Dr. Womack. We'll move to our next speaker now. Uh, Dr. Dominique Eugene. Dr. Eugene is a psychologist in Monterey, California, USA, and she obta obtained her doctoral degree in, uh, degree in clinical psychology from Fielding and is a licensed marriage and family therapist, a registered play therapist and supervisor, a certified trauma specialist, very important for our topic today, and an infant family and early childhood mental health specialist. She's co-authored a book on mass trauma and emotional healing and written many articles on culturally based concerns, trauma, play therapy, and so on. She has focused her practice in the areas of, <clears throat> excuse me, of children, family, and community well being. And her current research uh, interest focuses on female perpetrators of intimate partner violence with a history of childhood maltreatment. So, Dr. Eugene. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, as was just mentioned, I am in Monterey, California at this point, and I work with Monterey County Community Mental Health Services and Monterey County Children's Behavior Health Services. So um, for the most part, I also have to put a disclaimer out. I am speaking on my own behalf. My views do not necessarily reflect the views of the county. So I want to make sure that I'm clear about that as I proceed. Um, one of the things, several things that I wanted to try to cover in a very short period of time is that I work with the community. And what that means is basically, we work with dependency court, we work with indigenous populations, we work with people who have not necessarily gone through the appropriate channels to get mental health services. Most of it is being forced upon them. Well, they can volunteer. I should not say being forced upon them. They can volunteer for services, but essentially when your children has been, have been removed, the volunteer spectrum is kind of out the window. So um, there's a lot of issues that's going on at this point because as we think of what the reality is for a lot of people and what it feels like to be on the ground, we're pretty much working at this point that we still have to go into the office. County employers, um, with the exception of Department of Social Services, um, the social workers, they've been able to go remotely and work from home or their cars or whatever they can go to. Um, but as far as the mental health workers, we actually have to be in the, in the office. As of two weeks ago, we've moved towards being able to stagger our time in the office. Um, several of us are doing two times during the week at home. Others, you know, are swapping out what where they can be and what they can do. But it's only within the last couple of weeks that we had gotten the authorization to officially um, to officially move to work remotely. So as it's been developing for us, it's been daunting as a lot of us drive into the building and see that the parking lot is desolate, but yet we still have to go in. We still have to you know, be there on the front line with providing services for people. That also means that the way we provide services has changed drastically. Of course, we've all gone telehealth. Mind you, we work for community mental health, so taxpayers are not necessarily paying for all the computers, all the systems for us to work tele um, remotely. Um, so we've had to be very, creative in terms of us being able to provide the services and keep business as usual. We also have to make sure that we provide sustain sustainability. We have to make sure that we are still being able to generate a profit for the county and still be there for our clients while still trying to be there for our own family members. 
Um, several of my colleagues have children, so their life has been completely turned upside down as they're trying to manage their life, being the teacher full-time, working full-time remotely, and still working and helping clients as they move along. So the re reality of our world is like business as usual, but we're falling apart <laughs> behind the scenes. Um, there's a high level of anxiety. It's not necessarily just from the client's perspective, but from our own daily living um, situations. There's a sense of helplessness. There's definitely a rupture in caregiving and attachment bond because essentially for a lot of our family members who are preparing to re, um, reunify with their children, that's been put on hold. It's been put on hold indefinitely. Um, the court system has pretty much stopped, so there's no going into courts to plead your case or to show that you've made progress. So that's showing itself in many ways because the parents are getting a lot more angry with the system, but at the same time, it's not so much, they understand that there's, it's not us that's keeping them from their children in this spectrum, but it's not necessarily anything that we could give them answers for. Um, and a lot of people are looking for answers that we can't really provide them. Um, there's also been a high sense of confusion over God's role, the loss of religious communities and rituals that people would normally go about. As I'm presenting this, I can't help but think of Viktor Frankl's man's sense of meaning as we're trying to get a better idea of where do we go from here because there's no such thing as the norm. There's no going back to the normal. What we understood as normal does not exist and we don't know how and when that's going to change. So how do we reinvent, how do we recreate our society at this point and help with the transition that's going to be needed from a um, profound crisis, um, from a profound violation of assumptions that's being made in terms of where do we go from here? What do we do? How do we provide the services that we can on the ground? Um, as far as perceptions of fears and realities go, uh, we have, on a, on a normal day, we usually have an influx of children who are being removed because of child abuse, child neglect, a number of things that would go on. We haven't been seeing much children coming through our system at all, granted. We, not many people are really taking them away right now because where are we gonna put them? Where can we hide them? Although we do have shelters for them, essentially we could only house 10 kids at, the, at a time at the shelters. So we know that things are going on. We know as parents are staying at home and as parents are trying to do their educational roles at that point, we're expecting there's going to be an influx of, of child abuse issues that all of a sudden are being reported. Again, a lot of times when the children um, services are getting involved, the reports are usually coming from the schools. So if you don't have the schools that's overseeing all the abuse that might be going on in the household, there's no reporting. So we're, try we're just trying to relax and wait because we know that there's something coming um, from, the, from the whole process of domestic violence. We're anticipating there's gonna be an upsurge of um, domestic violence reporting that goes on. Um, a recent study has um, highlighted that there's a burgeoning sales of guns. And when you have high sales of guns and high alcohol sales, tra um, tragedy is bound to happen. We are expecting so many different levels of collapse that it's just kind of hard to prepare. And that's not to add to the fear that's already out there, but just to sit with the reality of something wicked this way comes. What's going to happen after, after this whole process goes, we really don't know. And I think that's also what's causing a lot of the frustration and, and, and unsettledness because we can't answer any questions. And as parents are notorious and, and um, clients are notorious for turning to their therapist or their psychologist to have all the answers, we have none. We can't even pretend that we have one in this, um, this aspect. So we're trying to figure out how to best help with the potential rising suicide rates that we're anticipating. There's a lot of things we're anticipating, but we don't know how to even prepare for them until it actually gets here. Um, so yes, there's gonna be a spike of depression, there's gonna be a spike of attachment disorder and PTSD. Those are the realities we're faced with. Those are the things that we're trying to figure out how to best prepare ourselves and to be able to help the clients and the patients that come our way. But in order to do so, we have to be settled within ourselves. We have to figure out what is the messages that we want to set out there? What are the examples we want to set out there when we think of the lessons that we've been learning through this process? 
how do we help regulate ourselves and our own families so that we're able to regulate the people that are coming along that we're going to really need the energy to help them to do what they need to do and help them do what they need to do. Um, I was listening to a speaker recently, Dr. Dermeyer, who had mentioned that there's a need to have three levels of, of people who are there to support, people who are there to really provide you the assistance that you're going to need. You need to find the, those friends, either help your clients find those friends or for yourself to find those people that are the listeners. Who, who are the people in your lives that you could turn to who are actually just listening to the events that go on without having to try to fix anything? Who are the doers? Who are the people that you know that you could go to? Who are the people that you know that if there's anything that comes up, that they will be able to take action with you when you're feeling paralyzed yourself? And who can you turn to when you need respite? And these are the things that we have to model for our clients to be able to help them move forward, but we can't do anything we're, we're unable to move forward as well. So when we're thinking about it, we have to approach it from a three areas, three aspects. We have to figure out how we navigate um, dealing with the events that interfere with our mind, um, what happens within our body, the physical arousal that comes up, the spiritual issues that come up. How do we help people sit with what they're going through, but asking them to not sit in it too long because it can be as devastating as it actually is at this point. What are we able to help people realize that they can take control of? We can't take control of what's outside of the outdoors. That's always the case. But what can we do to help regulate and filter what information we get? How do we censor some of the information that comes through? How do we help our clients center that for themselves as well as their children. Um, as women, <laughs> and men do it too, but women tend to have the superwoman complex or the Wonder Woman complex. Everybody wants to do everything and they can handle everything. Well, now with all of us being at home or the majority of us being at home, do we know when to set that, sit back and let somebody else help us? Do we know that it's okay to let somebody take control without feeling the need to handle everything, to be the woman that, you know, still working the full-time job, helping your children with your homework and helping with the cooking and helping with everything else that needs to be done either, you know, from the household perspective. So what can we do to help ourselves as well and not take on the burden? What can we do to make sure that we're asking for help? Not when it's too late and we're falling apart and you know, laying in a fetal position, but being able to I, um, articulate that ahead of time so that we're able to prepare ourselves for what's to come. And it's been a devastating experience in so many ways because for healers, we still think that we have the answers, that we can do it well and we can do it well for other people until now we're at home and we realize that we really can't handle it all on our own that parents who thought they could do a better teaching job than the, some of the teachers did, they're finding that it's extremely overwhelming. So how do we start practicing what we've been asking our clients to do all these times? And also, how do we actually make sense of the fact that, as Dr. Womack mentioned, a lot of our clients are undocumented. I'm, I'm in Monterey County, like I said. This is the capital for migrant workers. So how do we help them um, realizing the limitations that we have on ourselves and how do we keep the rage and the anger that's really precipitating throughout the world from really seeping in from what we realize is not necessarily other people's fault. So what do we need to do to prepare ourselves for the influx of events that's going on so that we ourselves aren't becoming part of the problem but really working towards making a difference? Thank, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Eugene. I, I especially appreciate your comments about finding the listeners and finding the doers. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one question. Looks like a Q&A. We've got one question that's come from Tatiana Asarova. Uh, what are the good criteria to qualify a trend in society as an epidemic? Don't we have unofficial epidemic of family violence, drug addiction, and so on? What gives a society a good reason to isolate only one specific trend as epi epidemic while ignoring others? Aren't these trends interconnected from a system's perspective? And I would whole, wholeheartedly agree with you that it does, but as it's been echoed already, there's a level of politics that outlines what becomes trends and what become um, uh, a pandemic. Um, 
So it's, it's a strange time that we're living in and we'll see how it comes out at the end. Thank, thank you so much for all your contributions there. It's uh, really important what you've shared with us there about filters and what we can and can't take control of and moving ahead there. So, and uh, you know, our prayers are with the, all the farm workers over there on your side that they're really doing the important work for all of us, no doubt about it. So thank you very much, Dr. Eugene. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dr. Tiffany Field, Field and Graduate University Clinical Psychology Doctoral Faculty. Dr. Field is uh, the director of the Touch Research Institute in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Miami School of Medicine. She conducts research funded by NIH, March of Dimes, and several corporations looking at alternative therapies such as massage therapy and so on. And she's uh, in, interested in preventing prematurity, enhancing growth and development of preterm infants, reducing depression, attentional disorders and pain syndromes and increasing immune function and chronic illnesses. Uh, Dr. Field has uh, received research scientist awards to support her 30 year research career and has published over 400 journal papers and over 20 books. She's also widely sought after by NPR and other folks as we learned earlier today in a different meeting. Uh, she specializes in infant development and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from you, Tiffany. Dr. Field. Yeah, so I'm trying to get myself on the screen here. <laughs> we see about half of your face. I know. I tried to. Uh, usually, you just uh, someone just asked, "How do we get?" Someone just said from the audience that we're not getting full faces. So I just pressed on mine. Uh, yeah, there's a speaker view also. People can see the speaker view also. Uh, oh. up the right hand corner in the screen. Yeah. Thanks so much. The first. Yeah it was on a phone so <clears throat> the screen is small yeah unfortunately folks on the phone it's it's difficult to see the full screen yeah and i i don't even usually it comes up with something like um show not working well anyway you don't need to see my face <laughs> you know we want to see your face <laughs> well i'm not doing it what is it whoa oh we can see you we're good we're good are you good yeah okay Okay, so um, I, I want to echo Dr. Eugene's words. I think that um, this has been a terrible crisis, um, but I, I would like to take a more positive spin on it. Um, before that, I would like to just mention, Dr. Womack mentioned Miami, and um, what's happening in Miami is basically uh, centered on one part of town where people are going to uh, take out places for coffee and congregating. So where the biggest epidemic is happening is in areas where they're not paying attention to the social distancing. So I think that's a really important point that um, Dr. Womack was trying to make and Dr. Eugene as well. Um, the nurses that I'm talking to, because I'm at the medical school, they say this is like war. They, they haven't, those that have experienced wars have said this is just like war. And the first week of it, they called me and they said, uh, can you work in the intensive care unit? Um, and I said, well, I don't think so. I don't know how to intubate. I don't know how to do any of those things. So basically what I've, um, you know, everyone wants to make a contribution in these times. And so what I've been doing is, is basically press. And I won't say 24 seven, but I would say 12 seven, which started at eight o'clock this morning with Calgary, Canada. And I did two NPR shows, a CBS and a BBC radio shows today. And they all asked the same questions. So I, I just thought to lighten this up a little bit, I'll tell you what the questions are that they ask because they're important, I think. Uh, the first one is, are we being touch deprived? That seems to be a real issue since we aren't even doing elbow bumping anymore. And um, the second question, well, I should address the first one first, but okay, so what I'm saying to them is basically that although we are not touching in public, I'm hoping that people who are in families and who are in couples are touching significantly more because they're proximal to each other and they have a lot more time with each other. So I'm sure they're doing a lot more hugging and a lot more back rubbing and so forth. 
And so I think that's very positive. I think that we haven't really been much of a touch society for a long time. In fact, a number of fielding students and I've been doing a study in airport gates where we thought we were studying social interaction, things like face-to-face -face interaction and touching. And in fact, we haven't seen any of that. 98% of the time, everybody's on their cell phones and little, little kids, little toddlers are on their iPads. So there hasn't been a whole lot of touching going on. And maybe what's happening now is since we can't touch each other in public at least, um, we are being reminded that touch is a very important social interaction. The second thing they ask me when I say, well, okay, there's probably going to be more touching in families in, amongst couples and, and children and siblings, um, is what do we do about the single people, um, people who don't have anybody at home, especially the elderly who are by themselves? Um, you know, what, what can those folks do? And I feel very positive about that too. I'm saying to them, basically, you just have to move the skin. You know, it's good to have a, a person that you're very, very intimate with to be moving your skin, to be massaging you or giving you a back rub or holding your hand or giving you a hug. But if you don't have that, the important thing that we're finding from our research is that you just need to move the skin. And what happens when you do that? You Increased vagal activity. The vagus is one of the most important cranial nerves. It has branches everywhere in the body. It slows the heart down. It slows blood pressure. Brain waves change in the direction of relaxation, like there's more theta waves. And stress hormones decrease. Cortisol is one of the culprit stress hormones. When you decrease cortisol, you can save natural killer cells. And natural killer cells kill viral cells. Ironically, in a time when we need to kill viral cells, we're not having touch. So for the singles, they have to be doing self-touch. And what I mean by that is just moving the skin. And you can do that by simply crossing your legs and swinging them. That, that massages your legs. You can walk around the room. That massages the, the that, that uh, stimulates the pressure receptors in your feet. You can do uh, crunchies, you can do sit-ups, you can do yoga on Zoom, that's been really good. Um, so there's a lot of, and just washing your hands is stimulating the pressure receptors in your hands. So that in, in itself is a very, very positive thing for our immune system, for saving our natural killer cells. So then the third question they asked me is, well, what's going to happen when we go back to what do they call it, norm? <laughs> I don't know if we're going back to normal because we have all these alarms going off about a second wave. And, and, and so maybe we won't go back. But I've been seeing a lot of wonderful things on the street. Um, people who were used to elbow bumping, they're now kind of doing it as a distance elbow bump. Um, they, even though they have masks on, uh, half of them have masks on, half of them don't, but when they have masks on, they make eye contact, they say hello, and probably a lot of that is because they want to be social distancing um, and they want to make sure they're taking the cues from the other person. But there's a lot of friendliness going on out there. And I think that we will have other ways of touching each other. We might have more face-to-face -face interaction. When I was watching the elbow bumping before, we couldn't even elbow bump anymore. I saw a lot of people smiling and laughing and just loving this new thing that we have called elbow bumping. And it was much more face-to-face -face interaction than when you shake someone's hand or when you go in for an A-frame hug, when all you do is you're surrounding their shoulders, you don't see their face. So I think there's a, a, there, there can be some really positive things that come from this. And um, I know we're, we're doing a survey actually on SurveyMonkey, my students and, and um, a bunch of faculty from psychology, and we're really interested in what is happening? What kinds of activities are people engaging in? What are their feelings? How does that relate to how many kids they have in the house or if they're alone? And uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that we will get a lot more information from, from that that research. And so I'm very happy to be here tonight. And thank you so much, David, for organizing and also 
and you, Richard, for organizing this. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, uh, wow, great practical advice. Thank you for the great practical advice uh, there. I have a question for Tiffany, and thank you so much for that, the importance of touch. <clears throat> I think we all understand that. Um, you know, this may go on for quite a while, uh, as, as you said, as other waves come about, and until we can do almost universal testing and know who has uh, been exposed and who hasn't, um, I just wonder how people will adapt in the long run, especially people living alone. And I wonder if people who have been exposed, who have gone through, and presumably we think may be immune, I wonder <clears throat> if therapists, uh, people who do massage and so on, who have been through this, could then perform a role uh, visiting people in homes and things like that who are alone. Think that's yes, well, that's an important question. I think nurses are doing a lot of that. I'm, I've been hearing that uh, nurses are spending a lot of time rubbing the shoulders of people who are uh, intubated in, in, in the ICU. And I think that that's great that they're doing that. Massage therapists, of course, are not, um, they're not usually in hospitals to do that. So the nurses are, are fulfilling that function. I would like to just say a couple of things about testing and, and uh, vaccine. And one of them is about testing is that I've heard of people who are tested positive one day and they're negative the next, the next week and the second week they're positive again. And so I'm not sure that testing, universal testing is gonna really be the answer because it, it, it's so fickle. Um, the second thing I'd like to say is I've seen uh, graphs that, um, actually were published several years ago in the American Psychologist that show that in virtually every epidemic that we have experienced in history, the, the curve, you know, it's a, like a, a bell-shaped curve, the downside of the curve is coming way down when the vaccine is introduced. And so basically people are doing things like the social distancing, for example, like just saying, I wanna, I wanna survive, I wanna live. Um, they're coming down on the other side of the curve before the vaccine is introduced. So I, and I think that's happening in this pandemic. We're seeing already the president is saying, you know, we've plateaued in many places. Um, we'll see, but I, but I think that we can't depend on testing and the, and the vaccine. And I think we, we need to just go on doing our social distancing, wearing our masks, and making sure that we're having a good lifestyle as much as possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Field. Uh, and we'll look forward to hearing more of your comments on various NPR programs and CBS and so on. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Jerry Lynn Hogg. Dr. Hogg is Field and Graduate University Media Psychology Doctoral Faculty and the Director of the Media Psychology Program at Fielding. She was the 2015 president of the uh, American Psychological Association Society for Media Psychology and Technology and the co-creator of Fielding Certificate in Brand Psychology and Audience Engagement. She's also the co-author of a fascinating study, Mad Men Unzipped. She integrates her passion for branding augmented virtual reality technology and digital environments with research to advance the understanding of the positive use of media and related technologies. She's a very coveted industry speaker and has over 50 scholarly presentations on media psychology and is a pioneer in this field. Her current focus is on brand psychology strategies, augmented and virtual environment design solutions, and narrative messaging for positive change. Dr. Hawk, Jerry Lynn. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, we certainly are living in interesting times, and as a media psychologist, I use strength-based approaches, looking at how media and technology influence our lives and how we connect, form relationships, and make meaning of our lives. So what I'd like to do tonight, um, along the lines of, um, that Dr. Field did as well, is pull back that curtain and look at some of the positive outcomes of all this that we're going through, and I don't want to make light of um, the seriousness of, of what we're all experiencing as well. But for COVID-19, I wanna call it, it's all about the connection. So um, the way we connect might have shifted 
um, not might have, has shifted. Um, but we're connecting now just as much as we ever were. And I would uh, venture to say um, that it might even be more. Uh, I know that um, many of you have either been yourself or have heard of others being overbooked with um, the evening Zoom social hours and uh, have even heard about, you know, this is a big uh, dilemma for the introverts because they need and want that time alone and now they don't have any kind of excuse to say why they can't get together for a virtual get together because we all know we're all at home and where else would they be? Um, so uh, just to, you know, some of the ways that we are connecting, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I want to talk about, um, as humans, you know, we're really wired for social connection and, um, now we're finding some beautiful, creative and innovative ways that, um, we can connect. And so also in that connection, um, with other humans, we're flourishing and we're doing, you know, we're building resiliency and, and self-agency and curiosity and creating some meaning making there. I, I love this quote that's um, from Kai and it is, we talk ab about this lockdown as a period of hibernation, as being dormant, per but perhaps we've never been more woke up than right now, more cognizant of the systems that normally keep us too busy to demand better. So while our calendars are, are um, uh, were cleared because of all the social distancing, they're now um, suddenly filling up with family and friends. And um, I'm sure you guys have heard about the quarantini Zoom happy hours or the Netflix um, viewing parties, or even just catching up on, on Google Hangouts. So that social distancing um, really isn't social distancing. We're not physically together, um, but, but we're having that opportunity um, to really connect. And, and Dr. Field brought up something that I really wanted to talk about as well, and that is the one issue that we're really worrying about is that human touch and how important human touch is. Um, but I think that was a, a gr great advice she gave about being able to even just um, self-soothe and touch ourselves. Um, and then, I don't know how many of you have heard, but dog shelters are now talking about being completely empty because people are adopting dogs. So what another great way of, of bringing in that interaction. I know I personally have um, celebrated a meaningful birthday for my father and created um, a Zoom party for him. And we each all had our little uh, birthday candle and cupcake or slice of cake, and we were distributed geographically. A lot of people are concerned about missing major events, weddings, um, uh, graduations, funerals. And, th and there, I've seen some very creative ways that people have sort of spanned things globally. If you think about it in ways that maybe, um, are more powerful than the way we you know, usually do it because we don't aren't always able to bring people in and bring them all in face to face in such an intimate way. I uh, also have attended a, a few uh, network or association kinds of events that usually are only held um, in person and be, they've had to move online and so had opportunities to converse with people and see people um, that I wouldn't normally have. So there are amazing things from gym workouts and free yoga classes and puzzle nights and trivia parties that are coming out of this. Also the fact that schools and, and colleges are now moving online and, and we here at Fielding are already used to uh, using this modality in a real powerful and engaging way. So it's, it's interesting to see how other people are, are um, um, starting to connect over that medium. There's also, and, and I know everybody's going to go, what? Video games are good? But there's a, a increase of video games, uh, particularly in the social games. And there's uh, one particular game called Animal Crossing, which is just a really simpy, simple, happy, social community building game. But um, it's uh, become incredibly popular just for the fact of that community building. Even the WHO, 
is now encouraging people to stay home and play video games and they have a hashtag, hashtag play apart together. So um, let me talk just a little bit about the self agency that this is creating. Um, while it's very isolating, we're developing some coping me mechanisms and in that the self, um, some self agency. I know a lot of you have heard about people doing some exotic baking and sourdough bread recipes are abounding and the idea of group puzzling parties and things or um, people putting um, Marie Kondo to shame and getting their closets cleaner than they've ever been. I have a quote from that movie, um, Julie Julia, and, about Julia Childs. And uh, the quote that I, I uh, am referencing right now is a horrible day at work, but when I came home and cooked chicken with cream, mushrooms, and pork, it was total bliss. And so that idea that just re-engaging with some of the more simple, what we consider the more simple things in life and what, how powerful and rewarding that can be. Now, there's a new cause of FOMO, and I think most of you know FOMO, the fear of missing out. So we used to maybe have FOMO because we were seeing envious of people's vacations and, and um, you know, all the different amazing things they're doing. Now we're looking at people's baking and clean closet and projects. Um, I'll come back to FOMO in a minute. But we all are also in a, comfort, uh, a nice comfortable zone uh, where we don't have to dress up so much. There's no dress code, or at least um, as we all know right now in the Zoom meeting from like the shoulders up. But the <laughs> pandemic has allowed us to slow down and um, look at our patterns and behaviors, our systems, and really re-examine really about what we do, how we're doing it, and what's meaningful for us. And, um, and again, you know, I don't want to diminish the type of fear that we're, we're exposed to, the loss of life, and the concern for our own health, our family's health, and our community. But um, while this time is really emotionally stressful, and even maddening. Um, I have a, a quote from Mia Lee, and she said, it can also reveal a need to find meaning and something redemptive in this. So much like I said, that idea of really trying to find meaning in life, we're just wired for that. So let me get back to FOMO for a minute. Um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be terrible if, you know, wouldn't this be terrible if, if this crisis um, made us just be constantly comparing ourselves and judging ourselves. And, you know, remember that we are wired for social connection, but we also can flourish and, and be resilient and find ways for self-agency and curiosity and making meaning. So there's this term called JOMO, and I'm going to suggest that we try JOMO instead of FOMO, and that's the joy of missing out and really spend this time of finding ways to connect, but then also finding joy in, in the, um, you know, the simple things that we're being able to do while we have this chance to be in our homes. And there's a Japanese concept of forest bathing. And that's that idea of taking a walk in the forest or green grass as, as, as stress relief, basically taking a bath in nature. And, Many of us, especially those in New York City and all, are actually even quarantined into our own home and, and having a hard time going out. I know here in Connecticut, um, our governor has just made it so um, really restrictive about what we can do to even just go out to the grocery store and all. So, hey, why not in a video game take a walk in the green grass? Thank, thank you so much, uh, Jerry Lynn. Dr. Hogg. Um, Wow, we've got a number of questions coming. The first is about uh, the future of social distancing. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, we've got already talk, as uh, Chris mentioned earlier, NCAA football coming up and orchestras, sporting events. Uh, what do you expect might happen here? And thank you for Jomo too, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> um, I I believe that um, we, the ideal situation is, is still to be able to spend at least some time 
in the same um, physical space. And one of the areas that I look at is that sense of, of presence. And I um, am very fascinated with augmented and virtual reality. So there, are, there is evidence to show that if we have some in-person time, we can have just as meaningful uh, contact when we're um, online or in a, a, you know, a more virtual uh, relationship. So I hope and expect that we will still come together. We're now seeing that there, there can be other meaningful ways that we can connect when um, the ideal situation isn't available to us. But when that's going to happen and how that's going to happen and how different it's going to be from what uh, it was, I think is still um, uncertain. We're, we're, each day, the information about how long do we have to social distance, et cetera, has been, been changing. This is an, a new type of pandemic we're dealing with. And I think that um, we don't know for sure how long that'll take and then what the new normal will look like. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to mention, uh, joy of missing out. Last night, we watched uh, Swing Time with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. We watched no news at all, only Swing Time. And I slept so well last night. Uh, Rich, I think you're talking, but you're on mute. I was saying we have a couple of other questions in the question box. Should we hold those for later or why don't we, <clears throat> let's take Penelope's question here. Um, it's a topic I'm actually quite interested in also. Um, <clears throat> the question is, do you think this experience has caused a permanent shift in the role of technology in our lives from the primary purpose of task accomplishment, information and aspirational desires, like impressing everybody, with all the things we put on Facebook and Instagram, uh, to a higher purpose of making a human connection and supporting emotional well-being. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. But it's it's really interesting too. Uh, why 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 we use it and what our needs are and what types of needs we're trying to fulfill. So we, uh, Dr. Pamela Rutledge is the chair of the dissertation. I'm lucky enough to be on the dissertation, but as students looking at at um, uh, a flourishing through Instagram photos. So not all social media is social comparison. There might be ways that we're sharing uh, joy and events through social media as well. But I do think people are um, beginning to realize uh, some of the positive potential of using uh, technology in the, in the virtual space. Right, there's also a question about the effect of ambient outside temperature on coronavirus, which might explain um, the current low spread so far in Africa. I'm not sure if... I would uh, say that's out of my expertise, uh, other than what uh, you know, the New York Times and other outlets are telling me. I think that's out of my expertise. So let's hold on for that. I just want to uh, thank you very much, Jerry Lynn. That was terrific. I just want to share one thing that I personally have found fascinating about this. And that is the fact that now we get to see all these newscasters and other people in their homes, as opposed to in studios. And there's something incredibly intimate and personal and warm about that. Um, I agree, I agree. Um, I hope they never go back to studios. <laughs> I was a sportscaster in San Francisco and he's got his kids involved in his sportscast. So let's move on. I know we're running, well, technically we have what, David, 20, 25 minutes left. I think we're a good time, yeah. So it's my pleasure to present, I'm, I'm gonna take over the introductions now. Um, Dr. Janine Woods Craig, who is Program Director for Fielding's Infant and Early Childhood Education Program. Janine is a seasoned occupational therapist and neonatal intensive care unit development specialist. Her professional work includes decades of emphasis in trauma-informed care, infant and early childhood mental health, diversity in social justice, and parent, in fact, attachment. She sits on many boards of directors. I'll just name a few here. The National Perinatal Association. Uh, she's in leadership with the National Association of Neonatal Therapists and was the inaugural co-chair of the Neonatal Therapist National Certification Board. And she adds, 
that her work around her own personal journey and neonatal trauma. Her work as an occupational therapist and her first passion as a mother of six. Be interesting to know how you're managing all of this as a mother of six. Uh, Janine, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Rich, and thank you um, for the, the pleasure of being here this evening. Um, I think you're probably going to find a common theme from what we've already heard this evening and, and are likely to hear um, moving forward uh, with, with what I have to share this evening. Um, as with others, I have about seven minutes to talk about something that I could easily spend about seven hours on. Um, and as Rich mentioned, I'm an OT by training. And my focus of practice has been in the neonatal intensive care unit for about 35 of my 38 years of practice. So today I'm just gonna walk us through a few considerations around COVID-19 with on the ground happenings in the NICU since that's really the starting point for me. And we'll look into some fears and realities as we consider some uh, specific outcomes. And then we'll spend a few minutes at the end to think about what needs exist from these reflections. Um, Hillary, can you move the next slide please? So as a developmental specialist working around neuroprotective and trauma-informed care of our tiniest of humans, I am naturally drawn to development during this time of COVID-19. So what's development got to do with it? I'm also a musician and there might be a song in there, right? Um, what we do know is that for preemies, the brain grows more while infants enter our NICU than any other time in their life, hence our work around neuroprotective care. And what I want to emphasize tonight is how critical brain development and sensory system input is in the context of social interactions, in the context of parent-infant relationships, stress, and typical development, and extraordinarily so while parents are in, um, in the NICUs with their infants. COVID has uh, created particular vulnerability in the space as many, many NICUs around the country are currently not allowing parents into the NICU. You know, I would say that beyond the indescribable parent anxiety of not being able to see their baby when already dealing with fear of loss is really un unimaginable in this space. Since the 1980s, we have stressed the importance of minimizing parent and infant separation in the NICU because even a, a few weeks of separation can have long-term outcome sequela, really both for the parent and for the child because parents are not visitors. They've become part of our parent dyad in the NICU. Um, and so my reflection in this space is that COVID has literally set our NICU practice back about 40 years. And even if only for a season of time, there are longstanding um, ramifications that I, I'm afraid we're gonna be facing. So I wanted to just touch on that briefly. Relationships as we know are critical in building healthy development and reciprocity between a parent and a child is really what provides a child with the emotional cues and provides the parent with the response that hopefully is delivered in kind of that just right way. And as an OT, I think about that through motor, sensory, language, cognition, all the domains for which child development is important. And that neurodevelopmental support begins with the infant in the NICU, where parents learn their infant's nonverbal cues of stress and stability. If parents, however, cannot be with their baby in the NICU, this cannot happen. And so I wanna bring your attention to the two pictures that you see on the screen. The dad holding his daughter was in the middle was a transformational moment in his life. Although he saw his baby as most precious, even after weeks, he was still terrified to touch her and he was there every single day, let alone hold her. In this moment, the mom and I supported him to do kangaroo care or skin to skin, can, uh, skin, -to -skin holding for his very first time. As he, hold his, as he held his daughter, um, he looked up at his wife, Lisa, and myself with tears, and he said, now I feel like a real father. And this is why parents need to be in the NICU, and even now. Yes, COVID is having real on-the-ground challenges here as parents are not able to be with their babies. And then from a stress standpoint, we know from the work of Dr. Heidelie Zalls, Edtronic, and others that mutual regulation is critical. So in the NICU, infants are co-regulated through sensory motor interventions and through the parent who's able to interpret the infant's cues. And certainly there's no co-regulation if there's no parent present for the baby. Babies are learning their parents' faces while in the NICU. My daughter, who also works in the NICU, where they're still allowing both parents right now, said she wished that they could have uh, clear face masks for parents so that the baby could see them. 
and you see the, the picture of the dad looking at his daughter with a face mask. These are the little things related to COVID that can have a large developmental impact. Facial recognition, attachment, parent anxiety, depression, and PTSD are but a few outcomes that I believe we'll be attending to with preemie parents once the worry of COVID is behind us. But beyond the NICU, there are families today who have preemie graduates and are dealing with fears and anxieties because their children are at risk. And so we find them sheltering in place in very different ways. NICU families are, are really facing escalating mental health challenges due to the um, virus infection fears, additional financial concerns, limitations, as I've mentioned, that they can visit their baby in the NICU, and being socially isolated also from their support system of family and friends. This stress then does a number of things. It impairs the capacity for us to have flexibility to respond to the, to the novelty of this COVID experience. Um, it's also impacted already fa uh, fractured routines. And there's so, so much more that I could talk about with regard to already uh, worried about disparities. Um, next slide, please, Hillary. So as we move from um, the on the ground professional space of what's happening, we can talk more about fears and, and realities as we think through our pediatric population. So just be on the NICU. First, our, our aim is the picture that you see in the screen with this parent and child. And there are a lot of wonderful things happening today because of families um, being together more. But we need to remember that children are not indifferent. Parent stress can often determine the outcomes of their child's stress. And so what you see on the screen are some results of a study just completed on behavioral and emotional disorders in children during COVID-19. Another layer of my professional work has been in the area of domestic violence and child abuse. And so we know that stressed parents are frequently more irritable, critical, and more severe toward their children. That stress creates maladaptive behaviors of the child, which can become cyclical in nature. The variables that influence and inform this are things like environmental, employment, changes in our routine that we've looked at tonight, uh, the parent's mental health, the child's social, emotional, and cognitive development, and all of these things as a novel situation are really getting in the way of the parent-child interaction that are about this picture of health that we aim for, that we see on the screen right now. Next slide, please, Hillary. So I've already spoken to some of what we know. Um, and once we get back to some semblance of routine again, I believe that there will be some amazingly healthy new family routines that I genuinely hope will be continued, for my family included. But there, were also, there were, will also be much to attend to in support of those who will have long lasting needs. And those are the families that I see in the NICU, as well as others. For strengths and resiliencies, I've selected just a few examples for which I'm sure each of you uh, this evening could add much more in your own professional and personal space. In terms of our ways of doing our day-to-day -day activities, that's kind of an OT thing, um, this was not planned, and we haven't had time to practice it. In our current state with COVID, families and children are being challenged, and we are being challenged both personally and professionally in knowing how to best support ourselves, as well as our students, our faculty colleagues, and our clients. So children in the house, full time, right? This new together environment is likely new to siblings. I just picked siblings as another, another idea. Um, as often siblings are not together all day, every day in the same space. Again, the newness and the how to be is an adjustment. Sometimes we see there are some positive interactions, of course, and sometimes we may see that more sibling rivalry or difficulty with siblings really knowing how to play and interact together. But on the favorable side, just because we are in a new situation that some families aren't used to, doesn't mean that we cannot build on positive social interactions. So really, in general, beyond my reflection of the NICU environment, routines have changed, some for the bad, but also for many for the good. Um, Hillary, next slide, please. And, and ultimately, I am the hopeful optimist. I'm the hopeful optimist in my family and at work. So along those lines, I'd like to wrap up with a sentiment shared by a, a pediatrician, Dr. Margaret Moe, and I quote, what is reassuring is that this will pass. Left in its wake will hopefully be its rainbow. It has already made human connection and ties stronger. 
It has made neighbor, neighbors lend a hand. It has made communities rise to the occasion. It has made the environment sigh with relief. It has made us all more intentional and thoughtful, end quote. So these are the outcomes that I hope will continue. And I really thank you for um, the invitation to speak this evening. Okay. That was, was um, uh, uh, Elise Rivera, Rivera has a question. Are there any particular education resources you would suggest in guiding parental explanation to children or students of the current circumstances, navigating changes in schooling, adapting to a daily schedule, et cetera? Any guidance? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a really great question. You know, one of the, I think one of the benefits that we're seeing um, nationwide are, is this global reach out from professional organizations, from individual um, professionals and even other parents trying to offer uh, helpful tools for how to show up in this very unique space of togetherness when we weren't really expecting it. Um, you know, certainly the, the associations that I'm connected with, with the National Perinatal Association, um, other national mental health organizations, um, my social worker friends, my psychologist friends. Um, it, it really would be a nice, since that question has been posed, it would be nice to be able to have some place for people to post resources, whether that's on, on the chat in this message board or maybe at Fielding, we might be able to have some uh, resource location, but there are a, a number of resources out there. Oh, that's a great idea. And maybe Fielding could create a, you know, place where um, the Fielding community could sort of collect resources. <clears throat> great idea. David, did you have a question? I'm, I'm good, but thank you for the practical suggestions. I'm struck again, uh, Janine, Dr. Craig, by uh, touch. And, the whole, and I've noticed it at home, too. I'm even afraid to touch my wife now if she goes to the grocery store to shop, you know, and yeah, somehow we need to move beyond this, but I'm, you know, it's, it's a difficult time. Touch is a powerful, powerful, powerful tool. Right, there's, well, we, if we have time for discussion afterwards, but this balancing between the need for touch, what we've heard, you know, a couple of presentations, plus some of the advantages we can get through, you know, through, um, through media, through all these new means of communication. Well, let's move on. Um, thank you again. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Liz Lennon, who uh, recently received her fielding PhD in human and organization systems. Her dissertation focused on doctors without borders, which I would try to say in French if I could, but that would be embarrassing. So um, <clears throat> she is a managing director of the Leader Factor, a firm established to work with CEOs, senior executives, and their team. Uh, Dr. Lennon's experience spans both the private and public sector. She's worked in executive roles with national accountability as an operations manager, senior policy and program advisor, counseling and organizational psychologist, management consultant, and executive coach. She was HR director Asia Pacific for NCR, a major multinational in the IT industry, and director of leadership and learning for Deloitte. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Liz and see you once again. Um, uh, hi, Rich and David and Hilary, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I, I'm going to talk about Australia. Um, we're a long way from where you are and it's a very different scenario. But before I talk about exactly um, what's happening right now, You'll see at the back of this collage is, is a scene from the, the fires that struck Australia from December through to February this year. Fires that were very much linked to um, climate change, coming from a series of, from, from years of, of severe drought, unusual um, heat uh, and weather events, um, and which were incredibly traumatic for Australia and for, I think we all felt it quite viscerally every day, um, watching for updates on on people, um, native animals, um, 
buildings, houses, hectares and hectares and hectares of of, of our bushland just uh, just burnt to the ground. Um, Firestorms, uh, uh, um, amazing scenes. Um, but I think what that did, to use a term from the world according to Garp, we were we've been we've been pre-disastered. Um, what that previous disaster did show us is it, it showed up um, how communities can come together. It showed up fissures and divisions between our levels of government from the state to the federal level. And it also showed us about leadership and people's expectations of leaders. Uh, our Commissioner for, rural fire, for the Rural Fire Services, um, Shane Fitzsimmons, came through as an incredible icon of steady, compassionate, informative leadership. Our Prime Minister, whose photo is in the middle of that collage, along with the Chief Medical Officer, Scott Morrison, our PM, came off as wanting. Um, he was in Hawaii at the peak of the fires on holidays and took his time getting back. And so that was widely discussed. Um, but thankfully, he has learnt. And so I'd say, um, you know, I can't compare our situation to the US or to Europe or the UK because to date we have uh, about six and a half thousand confirmed cases and 63 deaths. But Australia is well set up. Um, we went down into closing the borders um, early March. Um, we um, actually, since the end of March, any returning Australians have been quarantined at the government's expense in, in hotels. Um, there was a, an app, um, government app put up quite quickly about three weeks ago, giving us information and advice, which is actually pretty good. Uh, the state premiers who come from different sides, some are Liberal Party and some are Labor, which I guess is Democrat and uh, Republicans, have come together with Scott Morrison and the federal government in a national cabinet that meets weekly and makes policy decisions. Ideolo ideologies have fallen by the way. And we've had substantial um, stimulus, not just not stimulus packages, relief pack packages and subsidies to individuals and to businesses. So you can see down the bottom, there's a long line to Centrelink, which is our, our social security. But the, um, the supports available to people are quite generous and to business. Um, so I think for me, I've got up in the left-hand corner, my, my business, which is largely consulting, leadership development and coaching, has gone online. It's it's a Zoom app, um, WhatsApp world, um, with a lot of my work cancelled, which involved groups. But it's given me the opportunity to look at at some of the leaders that I I, I coach, and see the difference between those that can really step step up to compassionate leadership, which is both empathy and action, and those who are unable to deal with complexity and uncertainty. I think. Everyone's life has gone local. Local. We've been in social distancing, vir virtually locked down in our neighbourhoods since mid-March. And there's a lot of connection and community. And, and up in the right-hand corner, you'll see the bin outing guy. Um, a, a group of Australians decided that the only time they ever get out these days is to take the bin out for, um, for the local for, for weekly pickup of the garbage. And so they started posting photos of themselves dressed up to go on this outing. But I guess that just, to me, illustrates a unique Australian humour and a connection. Every day I hear children's voices at home. I see people walking in their neighbourhoods with their families, um, keeping a social distance from people like me. The big gap in my life is, is I can't see my grandchildren who live not very far away, but we're on daily FaceTime. So... For Australia, um, we've, we're actually at suppression, um, more than mitigation, at suppression, and there'll be a loosening up in about a month. But I think we will be, our international borders will probably be closed through to the end of the year. Um, Australia is an island, we can do that. Um, and I think by and by, Australians have um, taken take into this quite in a quite a compliant and positive way and do look to the federal government and the chief medical officer 
um, for Australia and for the states for their advice. Um, there's the usual conspiracy and, and um, politically motivated um, analysis around and some really good critiques because it's not perfect. But, but essentially, I think we're doing okay. Um, so, Hilary, the next slide. So in, instead of talking about fears and realities, I've decided to talk about what I think is at stake because I think we're in, in, in a giant human ex experiment and we're bumping up to all kinds, of in, in, into all kinds of things that we haven't had to deal with directly as a, as, a, as a species. Firstly, safety and a sense of coherence or meaning making. We all carry hidden assumptions about the world, things that we don't even know um, lie beneath the surface, assumptions about just world, um, about uh, the good receiving positive outcomes, the bad being punished, um, about, uh, well, there are a whole lot of Western assumptions. And I think these is my experience from working with MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières staff, was that these are the things that go first with trauma. Yeah. Um, yesterday, or the day before, I heard Four Arrows talk at the Other Fielding Part 1 seminar, and he talked about the very difference in worldviews between First Nations and Western thinking. Particularly, I, was, I, I thought about the spirituality and interconnectedness. Um, so these things are all up for grabs and for exploration at the moment, and these are the, the subtext that I think underpins our life. Um, we are all forced to make meaning. I see meaning making as a project for life, not just a, a project for an event. So this is a part of the continuum of our life. Um, my research indicated to me that people do continue to make sense of traumatic events over their life. So I think it'll be interesting how that we make sense of that. We're all challenged for adaptability and resilience, not short-term resilience, but long-term resilience and adaptability in terms of the psychological flexibility we can show, the patience, the tolerance, the capacity to manage ourselves. And we all have different, come from different starting points. Some of us are really anxious people. Some of us are much more um, manage our emotions differently. Um, some of us have very good coping strategies and skills. Other, others of us have never worked at home and learned to cope with, um, the distance. So I think we all go into this with different resources and capabilities. Um, I think we know from research that most people um, are resilient over time, that most people bounce back over a, a, after a, a traumatic event in six months time. But, but I don't know, this is a very pervasive event. So we'll see what people's resilience looks like in six months, 12 months time. Um, I think it's something that's difficult to predict at the moment. But what I'm seeing at the moment is that people are drawing on their resources here and um, showing quite a, quite a significant degree of resilience and self-regulation. There was an article in the New Yorker a, a, about a few weeks ago um, based on the work of, a, of a, a writer, Frank Snowden, who's written a book in 2019 on epidemics. And it was it's a terrific article. And he talks about how epidemics show up our vulnerabilities and our social structures and our political values. And I think that's so in terms of we're experimenting with the world of work, for example. Um, we're working from home. We're working at a distance. Um, all, all the firms that I work with, and they're mostly professional services, they moved out of the city and the cities in Australia to home got well and truly a month ago. Um, nation states have different reactions and responses to this. In Asia, where I live, um, Singapore, South Korea, and to an extent China, have, been, um, have worked in a very collective way. Um, and, and Australia, I think, has followed that general um, focus. We've got a very, very high rate of testing and tracing. So um, I think nation states respond in very different ways. And you, it's really the time where we see what we're really made of in terms of values. Um, trust, I think, is at, is at stake here. Trust in each other and trust in our institutions. 12 months or so ago, there was some major research in Australia about our levels of trust. 
And although Australians don't necessarily trust our politicians, we do trust our institutions. And I think you see that now in terms of our health services. There is enormous trust in our health services, which are actually quite well equipped at the moment. Um, we do have the ventilators, we do have the substructure to, to deal with this crisis. And of course, most importantly, wealth and inequality has shown up. Prejudice, disadvantage are thrown into high relief. Um, I, I really feel for people on the move, people in refugees in camps, because I think um, once more, they are the last to be considered. Uh, next slide, Hilary. So what do we need? In my view, it's really too early to say, um, because I think our world is emergent. I'm reminded of the Ramayana and the ongoing and continual fight in the world between good and evil. But um, I do think at the moment, it's a time for being observant, noticing how I react, how we react, and sense making in the moment. This is what I'm talking to my um, clients who are lead leaders and CEOs, to notice themselves, to notice their staff, to notice who's not coping, to observe what's going on at a, at a systemic and social level. I think it's a time for reconnecting with the value of solitude. Hannah Arendt talks about solitude, um, not as isolation and loneliness, but as a relationship and conversation with self an opportunity to think and to come back to the source of our conscience. Um, and Hannah also connects thinking with action. Um, it's the predeterminant for proper social action. So I think let's not underestimate the joy and the value of solitude. Um, I think there's always creativity anyway in the human condition, but Stacey always talks about creativity and opportunity at the edge of chaos, which is, I think, where, where we are. And I think we're seeing that at the moment, just in the way people are coming together, the way organisations are overcoming um, barriers. Um, I think also we're discovering new personal, social and political narratives. Again, that's part of observing, observing and noticing, thinking what does this mean about me? What does this mean about how I relate to the world? And of course, it's a time for human connection and self-care. Um, my guess is some things will change permanently. I suspect the globalisation, I can, I can already feel in Australia there's a pulling back. We will be more considered about manufacturing online. We will be more susceptible, suspicious of offshoring. There will be much more a focus of my tribe and my tribe in relation to the region we come from. Um, I think um, in terms of borders, again, wealth, inequality, people on the move, um, national borders and metaphorical borders will become stronger and more defined. Interestingly, in Australia, the borders between ideologies have fallen away. And I think there will be some things that cannot be wound back. Um, some benefits and, support and subsidies and support systems that have been put in place that are part of a traditional way of being in Australia that I think will be difficult to go back to the liberal, um, neoliberal mindset that have, have, has ruled in the last 10 years. I'm pretty sure that the world of work will change. I think people are quite enjoying being at home. So there'll be a recalibration there. And my guess is that there will be an increase in mental illness. Um, I'm thinking depression, suicide, agoraphobia perhaps. Um, given that anxiety will, be, will for some manifest in fear of going, leaving the house and entrenched disadvantage. So, um, Hilary, the next slide. Um, finally, um, I think the words of Albert Camus, who wrote about a myth, um, an imaginary plague in 1947, he talks about how he talks about how shocked we are when we know this is going to happen and we've already known that pestilence will come at some point in the last 12 months, two, two years past with SARS. But he talks about the whole thing is not about heroism, it's about decency. It may seem a ridiculous idea, but the only way to fight the plague is with decency. 
And I leave you with Aretha Franklin um, and a, a snapshot of her singing Amazing Grace, sharing her joy and love, and of course the wonderful Hannah Arendt, an absolute icon of thought and tolerance, which I think is what we need in the meantime. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz. Um, <clears throat> we're quite a bit over and we're having some technical difficulties with uh, April's uh, presentation. So I, I think we won't take questions at this point. Um, David, how should we handle this? Yes, yeah, so I think we should just... Think April. We've got April right now. So April, <laughs> and maybe Rich, if just briefly introduce April and April, we'll get you started. Thank you. Uh, well, Dr. April harris Britt is clinical psych doctoral faculty in the School of Psychology. She's a licensed psychologist in private practice. Her specific areas of expertise include trauma and violence, adoption and attachment, medically fragile children, divorce institutions, ADHD and learning disabilities, autism spectrum disorders, and multicultural issues. She is currently a member of the board for the Center for Cooperative Parenting, the APA Advocacy Coordinating Committee, and the APA Working Group to review scientific literature for high conflict family relationships and the AFCC Task Force on Model Standards to Practice for Child Custody Evaluations. You are in the trenches, April. This is wonderful. So I'm glad that we sorted this out and you're able to be on again. I know you're on and off. <coughs> yes, yes, thank you. So I'm gonna um, try and be brief because a lot of the themes um, have been connected um, throughout the various presentations and speakers. And, and I think I want to emphasize a couple of issues. And um, the first is that I want to acknowledge that living through this pandemic can present as a trauma for many people. And when you think about the impact of trauma on our bodies and our emotions and, and our feelings that, um, you know, parts of our brain often shuts down in order to survive. And that makes it difficult for some people to really fully process a lot of what's going on. And so we're looking for information from others in terms of how to respond. Um, other reactions that are pretty common in the face of trauma are your typical fight, flight, or freeze responses. And so for some individuals right now, they're left feeling really numb and out of touch with emotions, which can be normal. And for some other people, they're more apt to feel hypervigilant or anxious. Um, even more so than they ever have before. And others still can, can feel really hypoactive or depressed. And what I try and emphasize with individuals and, and, and clients and students is that there's really no right or wrong way to feel. Um, this is a place and a presence for us to just be. And what we feel like doing from day to day to get by during this process um, is, is completely normal. Next slide. I wanted to highlight um, a lot of what I see in terms of my observations on the ground as a practicing psychologist, as a faculty member here at Fielding, um, as a business owner of a private practice, and, and of course as an individual with, with children and, and, and grandchildren and um, family and loved ones. And most people are really focused on the loss of life that is associated with COVID, which we should be. And at the same time, I want us to recognize that COVID is affecting individuals, families, and communities in many indirect ways. Um, and it's in times of crisis that I think the social inequities and disparities that we see in our society are further magnified. And, and I don't want us to lose sight of that. Um, in, in all of my roles that I've talked about, I'm seeing increasing psychological distress, less um, often as a fear of contracting COVID, but more so as a result of people being concerned about their loss of income and businesses. This is true for the parents that I'm working with, the students that we have here at Fielding, as they're attempting to navigate home and work stressors, um, you know, parenting um, children who are at home now to be homeschooled, along with trying to complete their own studies or continuing their own work, and that's a challenge. Um, the children and families that I'm working with, we're, we're seeing these students who are challenged to complete online schooling that they've never done before, um, all while being very socially isolated. And there are individuals in mourning who are unable to have weddings and more concerning families who've not been able to hold funerals. Um, 
we heard earlier about, you know, children in foster care who now are not having supervised visits with their parents, and that could ultimately have long-term impacts on children ever being returned home. That's some of what I see in terms of my intersection with um, the CPS systems. Um, I, I'm also just seeing um, at the student level here at Fielding and the therapists within my own clinic, um, what it means to try and hold on to your own stress while trying to assist your clients and families as they navigate these difficult times. And so long term, um, I'm really concerned about how this might impact quality of care, how this might impact therapist burnout and things that again will have long term implications as to how we adjust post COVID. Um, and the last thing I'll mention in terms of what I'm noticing on the ground that's, you know, concerning that is one of the indirect effects of, I think, the financial stress and the other types of challenges is that there are higher rates of interpersonal violence, and we are actually seeing higher referrals for child abuse and neglect. So those are some of the things that um, I don't want us to lose sight of in terms of how else uh, the coronavirus is impacting individuals. So next slide, please. There are so many different perceptions of um, coronavirus when we think about fears and realities. And, and I wanted to just focus on one issue, and that's something that I'm seeing in regards to the mistrust and resentment within African American and minority communities. Um, I, I want us to recognize, and I don't think I've, I've quite heard yet, things about how there is still mistrust about government created and propagated diseases, and how many people within minority communities are seeing COVID as being. Um, very politically driven, where there's a disregard for economic impacts that are differentially impacting the most socioeconomically disadvantaged groups already. So if you think about this at a deeper level, it really means revisiting issues of privilege. And so we're all talking about wonderful strategies that we are using or that can be used um, to help adjust and adapt. But I want you to think about who are the people most able to work from home versus those who've lost their jobs or the individuals who might feel better equipped to help their children with homeschooling and what that means for family dynamics. Who are the poorest communities where not attending school might mean that children may not eat a quality breakfast or lunch for the day. And, you know, I think about, you know, the benefit of having pets. My, my dogs have definitely got me through this process, but who are in the communities that can afford to adopt new pets or um, to take online Zoom classes? Or just today, my greatest dilemma was driving around to three different stores trying to find a new bike for exercise. Um, so I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that there's some differential um, impacts in terms of how people can adjust and cope. Another issue that um, I see is prevalent within African American and minority communities is a sense of hopelessness and disregard due to the perception that they're not being recognized as frontline um, essential employees, like many white collar employees. So you, you hear about doctors and healthcare workers constantly being lauded as essential workers, which they should be. And we also, I think, need to remember the janitors who clean the rooms, the workers who are maintaining our food supply, and the cashiers at the, drugs, at the grocery stores. And so when we're looking at the media talk about um, how communities of color are mishandling or not taking seriously the COVID restrictions, um, it's important to think about all the other different factors that can impact rates of transmission and the health outcomes. Um, factors that are cultural, such as collectivism, which I think is limited social distancing, um, the necessity of being identified, um, of being an unidentified essential worker, like the individuals who I talked about earlier. Um, and then we have to talk about pre-existing health conditions that disproportionately impact African American and other communities of color because of the already existing systems in, of inequality. Um, so, so those are some things that are feeding into some fears and ways in which people are actually handling um, the different restrictions around coronavirus. You can go to the next slide, please. So when I pick a couple of different lessons that I think would um, really be beneficial, um, I want to talk about the media. Um, I, I find the media to be a little bit of a mess. It's, it's all over the place and that there's limited information 
um, and at other times overly complex information. And, and this is talking about, again, reaching communities that really need to understand what's going on and how to appropriately handle this pandemic. Um, sometimes there's conflicting information, and this is confusing the everyday person who's already operating in survival mode, which I emphasize is a time in which we're processing information least effectively. Um, and we already know about what it means to have like a constant bombardment of negative or frightening information and how that's increased to trauma reactions. Um, and so I just want us to think about how we can do better in terms of informing through the media. Um, I also like to think of this experience as both a test and a lesson. So an individual's perspective towards any given situation is going to speak volumes as to whether they're more or less likely to have positive or negative adjustment outcomes. And, you know, we might view this pandemic as a test to see whether or how individuals can learn to adapt in ways they didn't know how. Um, for those individuals who were workaholics to learn what it means to just sit still um, or to spend more time with family or to enjoy nature. Um, we get an opportunity to see the strengths of communities who are looking out for each other um, versus those who are deciding that they need to be more focused on just their individual selves. So I really like for us to think about the positives that we as individuals and communities can gain um, from some of these experiences. And then the last thing that I'll state that I, I feel is really needed from my perspective is just greater tools and access to, to wellness and self-care for some of the reasons that I've talked about earlier, um, but, but also just reminding ourselves that any given day can look different and we don't have to have rigid structures of what homeschooling needs to look like. And we, we, we need to just be compassionate to both ourselves and to others um, and think about what it means for us to get through this um, whole and also to get through this in um, a healthy way. So those are the lessons that I really would love for us to be able to emphasize and to, to think about in terms of how we're gonna come out on the other side of this. That is the conclusion. Thank you so much, April. We're glad that the Zoom worked for you there. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, very important comments and uh, suggestions that you have there. And thank you for ending it on the positive there. The idea about being compassionate to uh, others, so important. The Dalai Lama has said prayer is not enough, that we need to fight the coronavirus with compassion too. And we, we sure hope that that extends uh, further down the line. Um, we had one or two questions there. Uh, uh, Rich, uh, thank you all for bearing with us, those of you who stayed online here. Uh, we'll finish up just in a few minutes. Rich, did you want to share any of the questions from the Q&A? Uh, well, I'm looking at the Q&A here. Um, <clears throat> Marianne had a question, I think, going back a bit. That's the last question I have. And um, Penelope has one. Marion's question is quite technical, and I don't know if I can uh, do it justice, actually. Uh, maybe, Marion, you could reformulate it. Um, let me uh, go on to Penelope. What are some of the questions around psychological and emotional health organizations should be asking themselves when they think about people transitioning back to working in the office? How can organizations prepare? Oh be asked of any panelist, actually. <clears throat> um, I sort of cut Liz off. Um, maybe you can give the down under answer to that question. I think Australia is doing a little better than uh, the US is at this moment. <clears throat> so um, you're talking about how to prepare for people coming back into the workplace. Right. Um, I, I think that's going to be very interesting because I'm not sure that the world will go back to the way it was. I think businesses will find that they've, they've, there's huge savings in not having um, as much office space taken up and um, people working will also find, I mean, that's in, in office space uh, environments. Um, they'll find working from home to be okay. I think there's one of the, the critical issues will be reconstitution of teams. Um, because I think while most of the leaders that I know are working hard to maintain teams and teamwork at a distance, it's quite different when people come together again. 
and there'll be a lot of time needed to debrief this time that we've had in isolation. Um, I think there will be a real focus on restarting businesses and so there will always be a balance then between the energy required to restart a business and the, the performance demands and productivity demands on people to get businesses happening and the extent to which leaders can can and, and members of staff can support each other. So I, again, I think it's unknown territory. I don't think there's a formula of how to do this, except that A, there'll have to be some real consideration of policy and practices um, and what changes and what stays as it was. How, how, do, how does a business restart and what does that mean for the people in it in terms of their work routines? Um, and how, what, what, stra what strategies leaders use to connect with those that, who have suffered during this time away from work, both because they've been underemployed um, or because they have just missed the connection with their, their um, colleagues. So I, I can't really come up with any big tips on that question. Well, we, we can't ask you to solve uh, the problem. I will say that the governors of New York and California have come up with some pretty good plans actually uh, to do that. I have my own question for April, if I might. Um, um, the class differences that this has exposed, which unfortunately intersect with race differences often, um, is striking, as is war. I mean, every crisis um, shows the same thing. So we're not going to get into a discussion of how to change that system in this conversation. But my question for you is, uh, what I found, what I learned from you that I didn't know was that people in the African American community have these suspicions about the crisis and about shutting everything down and getting back to work, which I understand, uh, but acting on that could be deathly for them. So how do we, if we can't fix the system, how do we communicate the importance of following these rules, even though the rules hurt them far more than they hurt me, who can do everything I've always been doing from my home in Santa Barbara? I, I really appreciate the question. And I think that this panel is, is part of what's effective. And so given the mistrust of the government, and I think also of, of the media, um, having people that um, are heard within communities, whether it's faculty members or clinicians, um, that they're able to, to speak to individuals. And so something that I'm seeing a lot with my colleagues is that they're going out and they're presenting information, again, in a way that can be understood, not from a fear-driven um, uh, you know, um, perspective, but one of education. And they're doing it through individuals and through formats that make a difference, that feel trustful within these communities. Um, and, and so it's important, I think, to talk about everything from, from touch and how that's gonna help us adapt and adjust better to also understanding what it means to be able to go and get health screenings in ways where you're not gonna face discrimination or you're not gonna be turned away due to some other um, aspect of, again, these pre-existing systems. Um, so we, we just have to be better uh, social justice advocates and to do that in a way that um, feels respectful of cultural norms. That could be the topic of our next webinar, actually being social justice activists. Thank you, April. David, I think given the time, we should sort of wrap this up. I think so too. Thank you so much, April. It's a, a really important point that we uh, concluded on. There's no doubt that as Pope Francis told us, this is not a time for indifference. Uh, the whole world is suffering. We need to be united in facing the pandemic. Uh, indifference, self-centeredness, uh, division and forgetfulness are not words we want to hear at this time and, and already we seem to be moving in that direction in some places. So to hold together there, we want to ban those words forever about indifference and all. We're all in this together. So thank you all so much for joining us uh, for our panel, uh, especially to our panelists and uh, shout out to the alumni director, Hiller Molina, for putting this all together and to our alums, thank you all so much. And 
our prayers and compassion go out to all of those affected by the coronavirus. Thank you all. This is wonderful. Thank you. Stay safe.